The origins of the Abhorrence are an ancient and tragic tale. During the Age of Myth, the first Abhorrent roamed the mortal realms. He was a favored servant of Nagash, and back then he was fair and strong. His court of knights and nobles rode resplendent as glorious children of the night. He was known by many names in many lands, Sumero's Summer King, the Blood Rose Prince, and Ushoran the Handsome, to name but a few. Though the truth of his descent into delusion has been lost to the march of time, it is believed by many that the king fell out of favor with Nagash and was cursed with a hideous transformation. Malformed and filled with anger against his former master, the king became a monster like no other that prowled the nightlands of Shyish. Such was the devastation spread by the king's fury that scores of Nagash's kingdoms were destroyed, their lords slain, their peoples torn apart, and their cities reduced to naught but ruins and broken corpses. Angered by the king's excesses, Nagash imprisoned his wayward servant in a prison called the Shroud Cage a towering edifice of broken promises. Its walls reflected every lie the king had ever told back upon him, reducing him to a raving wreck, as twisted in mind as he was in body. So the king might have stayed for all eternity, had not the god King Sigmar intervened. In the first years of the Age of Chaos, Sigmar invaded the realm of death, incensed by Nagash's perceived betrayal at the All Points. During Sigmar's rampage through the great necromancer's domain, his armies unwittingly brought down the great bastion that held the shroud cage, and from its ruins scuttled forth the thing that would become known as the Carrion King. He loosed into the shadows, the Carrion King began to build his court once more. In lost and depraved mortal cannibals known as Mordants, the Carrion King found a willing source of servants. With his blood he created sycophants to sing his praises from the foot of his dark throne, and these in turn went on to create their own courts. So it is that each flesh-eater court is a reflection of that first court, their abhorrent ghoul kings trying to recreate in madness the memories passed on to them through blood. Many of those beasts closest to the Carrion King still live within the ruins of his ancient kingdom deep within Shayesh. In them, the blood of the king is strong, and their collective delusion feeds off and permeates the land. The further from these ruinous cities and empires the courts stray, the thinner the Carrion King's blood becomes though the madness remains undiminished. Doubtless long after the king's tale has been forgotten, fragments of his story will live on in the flesh-eater courts. A dark pantomime played out endlessly across the ages of the mortal realms. As to the fate of the Carrion King, nothing is known save that Nagash still seeks him across the mortal realms. Beyond the Gate of Tears, across the Gulf of Regrets, and over the icy peaks of Hell's Point, lie the lands of the Carrion King, a sprawling kingdom of shroud-tipped spires, shuddering haunted woods and seas of weeping souls, sailed by ghostly galleons. It was among the grandest of the soul blight empires. Those dark and glorious days are but memories now, the spires no more than broken fangs beneath boiling skies. The woods oaken graveyards and the seas sunken deserts populated only with the skeletal remains of ships. Even so, many of the first abhorrent king's descendants still call this land their own. They call these crumbling expanses by many grandiose titles. Though collectively to the inhabitants of Sheesh, they are simply the carrion lands. The brave or foolish might come to these environs seeking Gulkin for their armies. Necromancers, unliving warlords, and even brutal chaos lords arrive with choice offerings of Medusa eyes, gargant livers, or trogoth bile for the abhorrence tables, hoping that their princely gifts will be enough to coax the flesh eaters to fight for them. To look upon a flesh eater court from the outside, one might mistake it for a nest of cannibalism and horror. Mordants root around in piles of reeking dead, their filthy claws picking decaying meat from rancid bones while they snarl and spit at each other in a guttural tongue. Mobs of towering crypt horrors, haunters and their kin, loom in the shadows like deathless guardians, darting into the press of ghouls to claim whole corpses at will. In the midst of this pit of monsters sits the abhorrent ghoul king upon a throne of mortal remains. Tall and powerful, everything about the king screams that he is a bestial predator, from his lithe, corded muscles to the dark hunger in his inhuman gaze. However, this is not what the king and his followers see. To the king he sits upon a gilt throne in a great hall. Next to him his men-at-arms stand to attention or spar, ready for the call to war. Servants scurry about preparing another feast for their lord, or attend to the running of the kingdom. Within the madness of a flesh-eater court, each has their role. 
The king is lord and master of all, standing at the head of the hierarchy. Sometimes he might create other abhorrents to share in this glory, though they usually remain subservient to the king's desires. These other abhorrents are known as sycophants, and can range from a single heir to the throne to a whole brood of bloodsuckers taking on the roles and titles of the king's doting family. For example, the giblet prince is the heir apparent and closest to his king. The awful queen oversees the blood nurseries, caring for the newest of the brood and making sure they feed regularly on the red bounty their father provides. Then there are the sweetbread princelings, chosen companions of the giblet prince who are charged by the king to keep his heir safe, be it in the madness of battle or out on a hunt. Beyond this inner circle favoured mordants see to the daily running of the court. Above all other mordants reign the Vargulf courtiers, the greatest of which carries the title of Marquis Gruelsop. Regents of the court, they lead the royal mordants and are often trusted by their king with command of the court's armies. Crypt flayer courtiers and crypt haunter courtiers are field commanders and earn titles like the Lord Marrowbroth or the Lord Liverbelch, overseeing the soldiers of the Dead Watch and the Abattoir respectively. The position of Lord Chamberslow is held by a crypt haunter courtier who rules over the Lickspittles, keeping order at court. Then there are the Marquis Retchbile and Baron Gizzard, crypt gassed courtiers who stand as marshals for the king's massed mordant armies, be it the stalwart and proud ranks of the king's ghouls or the stealthy ghoul patrol. Over the long age of chaos the realms have suffered. Bloodthirsty killers have turned glittering continents into reeking charnel houses, and dark wizards have loosed storms of sorcery that have warped and twisted the landscape almost beyond recognition. In the wake of the destructive tides of war, a land becomes ripe for the slow, terrifying descent into a flesh-eater kingdom. Stumbling and shaking, the survivors of these fallen lands emerge from the ruins of their once great civilizations only to face a new and insidious threat. Starvation and madness take their toll, and the creatures turn to cannibalism and murder to survive. In time, packs of scavengers emerge from among the survivors to prey upon their erstwhile brothers. Soon, the darkness beyond the campfires of marauding chaos armies is filled with pale horrors and the sickening crunch and slurp of bones being devoured. Hearing the call of these hungry children is like a siren song to abhorrence. Whether it is days, years, or centuries later, such pits of despair and depravity will often attract the attentions of a flesh-eater court. In a dark mockery of the kingdom that came before, ragged skin banners flap wetly above crumbling castles. The king swiftly sets about creating in his own delusional mind a functioning state. Scouting parties range across the land establishing fresh borders for their lord's armies to defend. In the broken remains of cities, nests of ghouls take up residence, stockpiling food and weapons. These awful pits and midden heaps are the treasure houses of the flesh-eater court, and are closely guarded. More than one foe has battled their way bitterly through waves of frenzied ghouls, expecting lost treasures or precious grave goods, only to find craters filled with rotting meat and broken bones. The abhorrent ghoul king is always ready for an attack against his lands. Whether he believes himself the master of a mighty fortress, which in reality is a crumbling castle long since abandoned by the conquerors that put it to the torch, or a nomad prince camped in his homelands, he will ferociously protect what is his. Like knights of the realm, crypt flayers soar over the court's domain drawn by the hissing cries of the ghoul patrol. These flying terrors shadow those who would defile their master's kingdom, while ghoul hosts lay cunning ambushes in the invader's path. Flesh-eater armies show a level of coordination that has been the doom of countless foes.